Friends, I welcome you to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It is not difficult for you, but it is pleasant for me. And we're starting. John looked at me with a grin that only five bottles of beer can produce. So you're going to let them kick you out of town without getting even? No one's kicking me out of town, brother. This promotion has been in preparation for nine months. It just so happened that I got it after we broke up. What time is it outside the window now? Minus nine? Twelve? I will live in the sunny south, and it looks like my house will be on the lake if my offer is accepted. While you're freezing your ass here, I'll be sitting on the dock waiting for Mr. Big. Asshole, I laughed. John loves fishing, but he hates ice fishing. I would really like to take him and his wife Adele with me. He's like a brother to me, and his wife is an angel. Just at that moment, his angel appeared, taking off his coat and ordering a glass of wine. God, I froze my ass off there. Before I could think, I blurted out, God forbid. She blushed and giggled. Once, in an alcoholic frenzy, I told her that her ass was the gold standard by which all women should be judged. Her hugs told me that she's not angry, but she brings it up from time to time anyway. Especially when we are in a restaurant or club. What about that one over there? I looked at a quite attractive woman and grinned. Nope, it's pretty flat to be perfect, but she's still hot. It was our usual joke. If she didn't bring it up, then it was John just to watch me flash red. John kissed her and told her that we were planning my revenge. She frowned and I laughed. You should keep him away from these sites. They give him strange thoughts. I don't plan on doing anything stupid enough to go to jail or go broke. In two more months, I'll be living big and she'll still be in this tundra with Bubba. Well, that is really with Bubba. Could it be even more banal? Then I laughed. Besides, I think I've done pretty well with them already, haven't I? It was as sad and stereotypical as possible. I returned home in the middle of the day and found them in bed. I admit, for a minute the murder flashed through my mind, but then I calmed down and took out my phone. They were in their own little world and didn't even know I was there. When I had enough photos, it dawned on me. Martha hates cold and damp more than anything in the world. It was snowing fine, the temperature was about minus seven. I took the plug off the faucet in the garage and connected the hose to it. We live outside the city and we have a well, and at this time of the year the water in it is almost icy. Both were screaming and rolling on the floor. Bubba tried to grab his clothes, but I kept hosing him down. It turned out to be too much for him, and he ran out of the house. In a snowstorm, completely naked. He tried to open the door of his truck, but I had the foresight to lock it, and now I sprayed him with a hose. I stood right inside the garage and doused him every time he showed up. He screamed and begged, and the neighbors came out to see what was going on. One of their wives wanted me to stop, but my neighbor, a retired policeman, just grinned and took out his own hose. We took turns dousing him until the police arrived. His ass was thrown in the car, and if it wasn't for my neighbor, I would have been in big trouble. He told them that Bubba had threatened me, which was true. All the time he was jumping and jumping, he was screaming about how hard he was going to kick my ass and that I used non-lethal persuasion to try to keep him at bay. The sergeant just grinned and asked if I wanted to press charges. I refused and even let him come into the house to pick up his clothes. My dear wife was lying on the couch, covered with all the blankets we had, and she was still shivering. The policeman's grin widened. Bubba received a free trip to the hospital for a course of psychotherapy. Before nightfall, everyone in our small town already knew about the incident. I stayed the night at my mother's calling Martha and telling her to get out of the house in three days. She resisted, but my mother called the police again, and since the house was registered in her name, she was forced to leave. The divorce was not pleasant, and she almost had a nervous breakdown when she found out that the house did not belong to us. In the end, I gave her a car, which she just has to have and half of everything that we have accumulated, and by we, I mean myself. As a result, she ended up in a small apartment living on a lump sum that I paid in lieu of alimony and trying to find a job while she still could. John chuckled at the memory. Yes, he'll never get over it, and what your mother did is priceless. Bubba has become a laughing stock. Every time he says too much, they threaten to pour buckets of water over him where he works. The women look at him and giggle. One of them asked him in front of everyone at the bar where exactly the film crew was hanging out and if he was still suffering from penis reduction, or was he always so small? He slapped her in the face and ended up with half a dozen mugs of cold beer, and the owners of the bar kicked him out, forbidding him to come here. He thought about it for a while, and after enough alcohol, he came up with a brilliant plan. 
He would go to my mother's house and whip my ass to prove how terrible he was. He was knocking on the front door and shouting at my mom to make me come out and look into his eyes. Otherwise, they say, he will take it out on her. The downside of this plan was that I had already moved back into my old house. She calmly told him to wait at the door, and like a true idiot, he did so. A few minutes later, she came out from behind the house with her garden hose and doused it. She had already called the police, and when they arrived, he screamed and chased her down the street, eventually losing consciousness when she ducked into a neighbor's door, who slammed it in front of him. Mom was laughing hysterically. My God, this guy is out of shape. In the end, I almost walked so that he wouldn't fall behind. Tammy, I bet you'll be laughing again pretty soon when I run the long distance again. The police picked him up and shoved him into the back of the car. He begged to cover him with a blanket or turn on the heating, but they did not turn it on until they had interviewed everyone. It seemed like an eternity for the interview. He turned blue, and then the doctors were called, wrapped him in a blanket, and took him to the hospital. He was being treated for hypothermia again, and the police who questioned him made it clear that if anything like this happened again, they would react very, very slowly. He was then arrested for threats, trespassing, attempted assault, and appearing drunk in public. When he was examined at the hospital, the level of alcohol intoxication exceeded the permissible level by three points. It took him three weeks to get out of prison, and by that time he had lost his job. But he got a new nickname. Bubba is gone forever. His new name is Hoser, Break. He did it all by himself, and I couldn't have asked for a better ending. He left the city under the cover of night, and no one ever found out where he went. When Hoser left, Martha found herself with the prospect of living on her own and tried to do everything possible to achieve reconciliation. But it was too late. Besides, I have already moved, having firmly settled into a new place. Mom said she got engaged again a week after the divorce became final. She never liked paying her own bills. She must have been very upset when our old house was put up for sale. She tried to persuade her new lover to propose, but he refused. Mom got good money from the sale and gave it to me so that I could buy a house in a new place. It was almost enough to buy a house on the lake, which I was looking at, and when all the paperwork was completed, I owed less than the cost of a used car, which I planned to pay in three years. A few weeks later, there was a knock on my door, and my mother appeared on the threshold with three suitcases. Bring them inside. I'm going to stay here until I find a new home. What? Do you think I'm going to stay in this frozen wasteland while you live here in the sun? Besides, you're my only child, and I don't want to be 500 miles away from you when the grandchildren arrive. My grandparents died and left her their house, a brick two-story building with an area of 186 square meters on a plot of 80 acres. She got our house when she divorced my father, who disappeared before the first alimony payment was scheduled. Mom was pretty smart and kept updating the documents. When they found him four years later, he owed a lot of money. The judge forced him to return everything, adding 15% per month to the accrued alimony, which he now had to pay. Otherwise, he would go to prison. When I graduated from college, he still owed her for two years, and she didn't forgive him. I guess I got my vindictiveness from her. When Grandma died, she moved into her house, giving me her old one. Now I am glad that we have not completed the documents. There was a new apartment complex on the ridge above the lake, and she found a nice two-bedroom retirement cottage that happened to be right across from me. I noticed an expensive pair of binoculars on her porch, and she blushed, saying that she was interested in bird watching. Five months later, to everyone, I was still a Yankee who had moved into the old Smith house, but Mom was just one of the girls. In less than three months, she knew all the gossip in the area. She dragged her new friends into it, and suddenly I started getting invitations to meet my mother's new friends. And by pure coincidence, there just happened to be a sweet young lady who is not in a relationship at the moment. Most of the time, they were as confused as I was, but I made some good friends. Friends who didn't mind showing up in a bikini and staying the night. A year later, a woman came to me looking for her sister, whom I was dating. I haven't seen her for months, but now she's gone and the family is looking for her. She got out of the car and I was surprised to see that she had two children with her, twin boys who had just turned six years old. She had a disapproving expression on her face, but the short conversation calmed her down. I watched the children closely, and they stared at the dock. Would you like to go out to him? They grabbed my arms and dragged me along. Their mother called out, Hey, did I allow you to approach the water? I looked over my shoulder. It seems that you are in the minority. Take one for safety's sake, and I'll take the other. Let them look around. What harm can it do? 
They may fall. We'll catch them. They can't swim. Then it's time to learn. I laughed at her expression. Relax, in my youth I was a certified lifeguard and my certificate of first aid is valid. Let's just make sure we don't need it. Under our gaze, they ran up and down the dock, and every time they approached the edge, she shuddered. After spending some of their energy, they began to notice things like flocks of small fish swarming around the dock. I have a habit of feeding them and the big catfish hiding below. I took a can of cheap dog food, punched a few decent holes in it, tied a strong fishing line to one of them and lowered it into the water. After a few days, it was empty. I took out the jar and hung out another one. I don't know if it's legal, but it's effective. Fish, yes. Let dad bring you over sometime and you can catch her. One of them looked at me with very sad eyes for a six-year-old child. I don't have a dad. The way he said it made me think that this man was dead. So I expressed my sympathy to him, to which she snorted, You sympathize with the devil. He did not die, but simply fled to unknown lands. He hasn't been seen since they were two years old. I didn't know what to say to that, but I repeated the offer, saying that she could bring them too. I could tell by the look in her eyes that this wasn't going to happen in this life, but I waved it off. We were just about to go out on the porch when mom came into the house. Hi, honey. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company. I just sighed, sure that the binoculars had told her about the guests. It's okay, Mom. This is Annabelle's sister. I'm sorry. I don't know her last name. She came here looking for her sister. Maybe you can turn on the message processing channel and see if there's anything there. Apparently, she has been missing for a long time to cause concern. I'll take care of it. I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Juliet, if you find out anything, I will be very grateful to you. I'll try, dear, but who are these wonderful young people? She smiled for the first time, and it made her look completely different. The one on the left is Tony, and the one on the right is Mark. Mark was looking at the dish his mother was holding, and she smiled. I just brought my son a cookie. Children never get old enough to give up cookies. Don't you guys want to, too? Maybe a lemonade? Juliet was embarrassed and tried to refuse. Nonsense. One cookie won't kill them. If this had happened, Al would have died in his early teens. While everyone was settling down on the veranda, I brought lemonade. Mom pressed the phone to her ear, often saying, uh-huh. Juliet seemed to be in a much better mood already. Mom took the phone away and grinned. Betty talked to Irma, she talked to Gloria, she talked to Jade, and she told her that her cousin saw your sister two cities away at Traveler's Rest with Joe Morgan. You know this man is married, right? Also on a cute girl. It will kill her. Juliet burst into tears and her mother hugged her. The next moment, they were already sitting in her minivan and driving out of town, leaving the children with me. We stared at each other for a few minutes. Do you want to go fishing? Yes, they really wanted to. I took out a couple of light fishing rods and grabbed some worms from my worm farm, a plastic container that I kept filled with night crustaceans, feeding them with compost. Then I went to my boat and took out two life jackets. I'm the only one here and I want you to be safe. If you fall, you will immediately pop up like a cork and everything will be fine. Now be careful. They tried their best, as only six-year-olds can, and they were doing well. Mark even caught a kilogram catfish. He wanted to keep it for himself, but when I asked if he personally wanted to skin it and roast it, he let it go after I photographed them. Tony felt slightly deprived until he caught a very good-sized crappie, freshwater ray-finned fish, and took a picture too. After an hour, they began to lose their fuse and we began to fold up. I threw the remaining worms back into the container and took the children to wash. They smelled strongly of fish and bait. To get rid of the stench, they wanted to take a bath, so I put them in the jacuzzi and turned on the nozzles. They screamed and laughed while I took their clothes to the washing machine. Soon it will be clean and dry. I hope so do the boys. Their clothes had barely started to dry when they got out, so I helped them dry off as much as possible, and they put on a couple of my t-shirts. They hung down to his knees. After I sat them down on the couch and turned on the cartoon channel on the big screen, I went to check their clothes. When he returned, they were already snuggled up to each other and fast asleep. Not knowing what else to do, I started dinner by cooking grilled pork chops with fried corn, one of my favorite dishes. I had some baked beans left, so I warmed them up too. And he was so engrossed in his occupation that he did not hear the car drive up. Juliet came out onto the veranda so furious that she was all aflame, and my mother walked behind, grinning. Before she could explode, Mom asked what we had here. The motion woke up the boys and they flew out, 
climbed on top of their mother and began to tell her about fishing, how much they liked everything, and that they had a dip in the jacuzzi. My mom went and got their clothes, took them into the house and dressed them. I tried to distract her. Have you found Annabelle? Tears welled up in her eyes. She's using again, and this asshole married guy is her dealer. Things got pretty tense, especially when I called his wife and told her where he was. She was only a minute away from us and caused real hell until the cops arrived. When drugs were found in the room, Annabelle and the asshole received a free trip to prison, and his wife said she would use the time it would take for him to be released in order to find a lawyer. We will try to collect on bail, but I don't know if we will succeed. When I was with her, she didn't take drugs. What happened? She met and fell in love with the wrong man. He got her hooked on drugs and she didn't regret it. Talk to the district attorney, maybe he can persuade her to make a deal and go to a rehabilitation center. If there were enough drugs in the room, she faces criminal charges. There were a lot of drugs in the room. They were there precisely to renew their bond. I saw my mother and the boys coming out the door into the courtyard. And here are your children. Put on a brave face and enjoy your meal. I'm sure cooking is the last thing on your mind right now. I lit candles to scare away mosquitoes. The boys were full. Their clean clothes were stained with barbecue sauce and butter. But their mother never complained, smiling, seeing them so happy. Later we lit a fire and I let them roast marshmallows. Mom helped Mark and Juliet helped Tony. I was grinning, thinking that the boats passing by thought they were just another happy family in the suburbs. I was exhausted again and I had to carry them to the car fastened their seatbelts, and promised that they could come back any time their mother allowed, if she came too. She smiled and kissed my mother and me on the cheek. When their taillights disappeared over the hill, we returned to the house and started drinking coffee. She's beautiful. Yes, she is beautiful. These boys are just adorable. Yes, she's been having a hard time since her husband disappeared. Mom. What? Stop it, okay? Yes, she is sweet, and her children are wonderful but she harbors a lot of anger and until she lets it go, she will not suit anyone. I'm not in the mood to try to reform anyone. It might be worth a try. Then do it yourself. I wish I hadn't said that. Mom adopted Juliet, and soon the boys began to call her grandma. She practically ate their adoration with a spoon. Soon they were trooping down the hill to sunbathe on my porch, and I stayed to mess with the boys. I endured it twice, and the next time they came, I grinned. Enjoy it. I have things to do and I won't be here until tomorrow. Lock the door when you leave, okay? I had an appointment with a little beauty for a simple, no obligations, no expectations, except for a good time. We went to a hotel 60 miles away, rented a room, went to a restaurant, then to a bar where we partied late into the night. Then we went back to the room, ripping off our clothes and playing with body parts until we were naked. The first time was fast and furious, and then we hugged and slept for a couple of hours before proceeding to a more relaxed second round. We got up late, took a shower, and then went back to bed to impress each other with our oral skills. I think I won by bringing it to three climaxes against my one. We took a shower, checked out, and on the way home I stopped at an expensive boutique to buy her a new dress. The old one was in her suitcase in a torn state. I dropped her off, kissed her at the door, and then went home. If we saw each other again, it would be funny but there was no spark after making love, and we both knew it, so I doubted a repeat. An hour later, my mom showed up at my door. Did you have a good time? Great, mom. Thanks for asking. Juliet was a little upset when you left. Why? Because she had to look after her own children for a change? You adopted them, not me. You're raising them. And I'm talking more about mom than about the kids. Mom was more than excited. It was inappropriate. I know how stubborn you are, but I was just hoping to give you a little push. She is a very nice woman. How should I know? Every time I see her, you and the kids are with her, and we don't talk that much except about how to handle the boys. Mom, you're not pushing, you're pushing. Drop it. This silenced her, and she soon left. Two weeks later, Juliet drove up to my front door. I was surprised to see her alone and quickly hugged her. Where are the boys? They spend the night at your mom's, along with Jen's two children. They've set up a tent in the yard, but I bet they'll run into the house at the first owl call. I came to ask if you would take me for a ride on your boat. It would be great to spend some adult time on the water, if you're not busy. I need to check my calendar. Look at that. I am absolutely free this afternoon and evening. I'll go cook everything and we'll put the fridge on. I won't drink while I'm steering the boat. 
but there's an almost full bottle of whatever red you like in the fridge. Take it, a few bottles of water, some food, and we're ready to go. My boat is quite large, a cross between a motor yacht and a boat, with a very powerful engine that can easily pull water skis. She has already prepared the refrigerator and changed into a very beautiful bikini and cape. When she saw my look, she grinned. I plan to sunbathe a little while we're here. Watch the water. I promise nothing. I got into my shorts and took some beach towels with me. I have to say that we had a great time. She was as relaxed as I'd ever seen her. I tried to teach her how to steer the boat, but she wasn't interested. We were walking at a pretty good speed, and she was watching the water rush by. I bet you can easily pull a skier on this thing. I used to like it. I slowed the boat's engine to idle and reached into the locker, pulling out a pair of skis and a life belt. She initially refused and shook her head, but her body was ready for it. It took her several attempts to get on skis, but after 30 minutes, she was already getting high. I noticed a couple of boats passing by, and the guys were hooting. But I chalked it up to a pretty woman in a little bikini until I reached out to help her into the boat. I grinned and said that she might need to adjust her wardrobe. She looked down, but instead of screaming, she giggled. That explains why the guys were staring. I guess I gave them a show, right? Just as she said this, a boat with children, high school students, and students sailed past. One was almost hanging over the side of the boat. Show me your breasts, he shouted amid wild laughter, and instead of getting angry, she walked to the side of the boat and jerked off her top, twirling it over her head. Then she turned around, grabbed her swimming trunks, rolled them up until they were just a strip between her buttocks, and bent down. They almost crashed into another boat. She disappeared from sight under the awning and I pressed the throttle and gave full throttle until they were out of sight. So you're an exhibitionist now? Do you mind? Not at all. Feel free to show me everything that is convenient for you. I will never mind. She was about to put on a top, but grinned and threw it off. I'll get some sun. Don't let me burn out. And how do I do that? Juliet rolled her eyes. We stayed at the lake for a couple of more hours, and then we had a second round on my bed. She dozed off, and I called my mom to make sure she had the boys. She giggled and said yes, and I informed her that Juliet was napping. Then I asked her to give us a couple of hours before bringing the boys to dinner. I cooked everything, including the side dish, left the steaks to marinate, and rest until it was time to wake her up. I kissed her, and as soon as she came to, she jumped out of bed. Boys, I was too late. I stopped her by kissing her. They're all right. Mom will bring them in about 30 minutes, so I suggest you take a shower and get yourself cleaned up. I'll light the coals. By the time Mom and the boys arrived, Juliet was wearing shorts and one of my t-shirts, and her hair was pulled back in a wet ponytail. Mom smiled at her, and she flushed red. Then they hugged tightly. I took the boys outside with me so they could talk. They both came out grinning and sat at the table drinking tea while I set out the dishes. Then Mom took out a banana pudding, which she had hidden in the refrigerator while we were at the lake. Mom and I received nice hugs from Juliet and the boys, as well as a few kisses from her when the boys weren't looking. We watched the taillights disappear around the bend. Mom grinned expectantly. Not now. Let me get through this for a day or two. She kissed me on the cheek and left, practically galloping up the hill. Juliet and I started dating. At first, she was slightly unpredictable, and it took her several months to get used to a man who treats her with respect. On weekends, she lived with me, and the boys spent time in our house, then in Mom's house. I've made good fishermen and deckhands out of them. On their birthday, we threw a party for them. They seemed to be popular because my house was filled with about 20 children and their parents, and Mom and Juliet played the role of housewives. Mom baked two types of cakes, saying that every child should have their own, and if Tony likes red velvet, then Mark likes lemon. The children took a small piece from each, and the parents who were with us did not hesitate to take a piece. I met some nice people and invited a few couples for a day at the lake without children in a couple of weeks. I bought the boys some great lightweight rods, short enough for them to handle, and soon the fathers who were with us were helping me put the children on the dock while they splashed their feet in the water. All my baits worked, and everyone caught small bream or crappy. After lunch, we lit the grill and began to have dinner. Sausages, hamburgers, German sausages, a bunch of pork chops and several chicken breasts, and Juliet and Mom set the table. Baked beans were a big success, and I knew that a few t-shirts would not be left without stains, but no one seemed to mind. Then we built a fire in my hearth, and everyone started frying marshmallows and making s'more, toasted marshmallows and a piece of chocolate folded between two crackers. 
When everyone left, most of them had to be carried. Mom took the boys to the bathroom, and Julie and I were finally able to sit down. Both sighed heavily as they took off their shoes. Forty-five minutes later, Mom came out and woke us up, saying she was leaving. We barely had time to take a shower before we collapsed into bed. I was surprised when Mom joined us on the boat along with other invited couples, and was not alone, but with Hiram, who turned out to be a nice guy and was obviously in love with Mom, so I relaxed. We rode for a couple of hours, then stopped on a small island, built a fire in an existing campfire and ate leisurely. They didn't let me do anything, saying that I needed to be pampered. Julie, Mom, and other wives and girlfriends were looking forward to me. Beer and wine appeared, and soon the girls were left to themselves, laughing and giggling when one of them screamed, You're lying, and everyone burst out laughing. I wondered if I should give out life jackets while we were helping a couple get on the boat. Julie was wearing a pretty bikini, as were Jenny and a woman named Charisma. Alice was wearing a modest one-piece yellow swimsuit with a high neckline at the bottom, and I wondered if there was a bikini in the world that could hold her breasts. Size four, her husband later boasted. They were all sitting in front in a sunken sunbathing area when a group of men of college age and older sailed past. They noticed the women and the guy driving the boat almost knocked her over while turning around. They slowly swam back, whistling and hooting, until one stood up, swaying wildly. Show me your breasts. They were laughing, we were laughing, and suddenly Julie and Jenny stood up, pulling off their tops and twirling them over their heads. Charisma jumped up next. Then Alice looked at her husband and grinned, stood up and pulled down the top, exposing an impressive set of mammary glands. The boys screamed, and then the cherry on the cake mom shocked us all by jumping to her feet and unbuttoning her top. Nice breasts, Grandma, they shouted. By that time, we were already close to them, and I accelerated before they could turn around. We swam a few miles before all the girls put on their tops again. The husbands laughed, and it calmed me down. You never know when you're going to meet a jealous asshole. This incident was later laughed at for many years. I have made some good friends, fishing and golf buddies. Usually their wives or girlfriends showed up at my house and sunbathed, looking after the children who were swarming around. Finally, summer ended and we went on a couple of cruises to enjoy the autumn foliage. Julie was still spending weekends with me, and the boys and I were hoping that they would move in with me permanently. The first few times I brought it up, she brushed it off, saying she wasn't ready yet. Then the rumors began to spread. She was seen with the same man three times, once at a restaurant in a nearby town and twice at local clubs. The only one who told me about it was my mother. There were tears in her eyes. It may be nothing, son, but I thought you should know. Being firmly convinced that if I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe it, I looked into four clubs in our city. She wasn't in any of them, but at the third one when I decided to go home, I saw her car. She must have arrived there late. They were lying on the floor, cheek to cheek. There was no free space between them, and he was stroking her ass through tight jeans. I watched them for half an hour until they came out. I gave them a few minutes and got out, stopping by her car. It's hard to tell if they're doing anything serious, but the windows were fogged up. Without thinking, I knocked on the window until he lowered it. I saw that her bra was lying on his lap. What do you want, asshole? Oh, nothing. I just wanted to say hello to Juliet. I'm already leaving. Have fun. Her eyes widened when she heard my words, but by that time I was already leaving, I heard the car door open and there was a scream. But by that time, I was already in my truck scattering gravel, pulling out of the parking lot. It took two weeks before she plucked up the courage to come without the boys. Can I talk to you? Of course, come in. It's pretty cool now. Because of the time of year, I offered her a cup of coffee, and when it was poured, we sat down at the kitchen table. She took a few sips before speaking. Do you want me to tell you about it? Not really, but if you feel the need to lighten your soul, then go ahead. I think the answer surprised her. I never promised that we would have an exclusive relationship. You're right. On the other hand, you never told me you were dating anyone else. It's just Gary. Well, I'll sleep better that way. On Friday after that, I passed the tests. I just got the results. I'm clean. He's clean. Why are you acting so nasty? You don't know what is disgusting yet. Do you have feelings for him? Yes, no, I don't know. It's good that I know. I'm not going to be your backup plan, Julie. You can't sleep with him for a week and then bring your leftovers to me for the weekend. You knew that I wanted to deepen our relationship? Yeah, that would be a mistake. 
I think you should stay away from me for a while, Juliet, until you calm down. It won't change anything. I'll never be able to trust you again. So let's agree that it was fun and move on with our lives. Bring the boys, don't hide them from my mother or from me for that matter. They are not to blame for anything. For almost an hour, she tried to get me to accept the situation, then sighed, hugged me and left. Mom was devastated. She became very attached to the boys. A couple of weeks later, she called Julie, said she wanted to see the boys, and insisted that she bring them to visit. She didn't stay, dropped them off, and said she'd be back in three hours. Mom said they were very upset that I wasn't seeing their mom anymore, and asked if she thought I was mad at them. She immediately called me, and 30 minutes later, two happy boys were climbing up to me. I told them that they were always welcome, regardless of whether I was with my mother or not, and promised that we would go fishing as soon as it warmed up again. Winter has passed, and snow has fallen once all season. At home, snow fell immediately after Thanksgiving, and the ground remained white until the end of March. A bit harsh even for those places. I persuaded John and Adele to come to me in February. They stayed with me for about a week, and we even managed to fish a little. Adele was spending time with her mom, and I took John to play golf, and the week passed quickly. They were talking about how they didn't want to come back, and I suggested, so move here. I will be able to find John a job where I work myself, perhaps for more money than he earns now, and the cost of living here is quite low. Both of your parents' couples are retired and live even further south, so you'll probably see them more often. I have a lot of space so you can stay with me until you find something you like. Think about it. I did not tell them that I had been promoted and was now an assistant factory manager, with a good salary increase and some nice bonuses. They promised to think about it, but I knew John wouldn't agree. He likes his job and has a large network of friends there. Adele would have moved in right away. They got married right after she graduated from high school, eight years ago. I wondered why they still didn't have children. She was 26 and John was a few years older, and the clock should be ticking. About a week after they left, I asked my mother about it. A look of sadness crossed her face. They can't have children, darling. Due to some illness, John cannot become a father. Adele wants to adopt a child, but he doesn't really want to. Why? If I were him, I would be all for it, especially if my wife wanted it. She shrugged her shoulders. Men are different, dear. He may think that every time he looks at an adopted child, it will remind him that he could not give such a child to her. Who knows? I think she's right. I go on dates quite regularly. It probably helps that I'm one of the most eligible bachelors around. And although at least three people want to deepen the relationship, there is not enough spark to make me think about it. Mom was desperate. Then something happened that changed my life. I got a call in the middle of the night, and I didn't understand a word of what the female voice was trying to tell me. Finally, she calmed down and said that I should come to her. John is sick. I calmed Adele down as much as I could on the phone, and then I called my mom. She flew with me. Mom always loved John and Adele, calling him her second son, and Adele the daughter she never had. We rented a car at the airport, and an hour later we were driving up to their house. Adele met us at the door, sagging in her mother's arms and sobbing. I found John on the couch. Looking at him, I realized that he didn't have long to live in this world. Being always quite stocky, but with a rich musculature, he looked like he weighed 68 kilograms or even less. His skin was gray and his breathing was labored, but he grinned anyway when he saw me. I know I look like shit. He had cancer, and it was spreading fast. He resisted going to the doctor until it was too late, and there was nothing they could do with him except send him home and write a prescription for painkillers. Five months ago, he was given three months. I sat by his bed and we talked all night, remembering what we had done, places we had been, friends we had never seen again, moving from one topic to another, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying quietly. Towards morning, he grabbed my hand. Take care of her, man. Promise me. I solemnly promised him, and he relaxed. Later, the next day, he handed me a folder. Whatever she needs. Insurance information, bank accounts, a week after I found out, I paid for the funeral. She won't be able to think coherently, so you have to guide her. I tried to brush it off. We still have a lot of time for this. You need to hold on. By that time, he was already lying on a hospital bed in the ward and grinning. You've always been an optimist. That night, he died in his sleep, and his wife held his hands. He was 33, and she was 27. The rest was a blur. I notified the funeral home, and they sent a man to pick up the body. The police were called, 
and the coroner examined his body at the morgue after which he certified the death certificate. We followed his instructions to the smallest detail, and I was surprised by how many people gathered. But everyone who knew him loved him. During the funeral, I sat on one side of her, and her father sat on the other. Mom was next to me, and Adele's mother was next to her. I spent my entire vacation helping her sort out the paperwork that always follows death. I gave a copy of the death certificate to their insurance agent, and a week later she received the check. The agent was my friend, and everything was simple and clear. In the end, I had to go back to work, and Mom promised to stay with her for a while. She stayed there for three weeks, and when she returned home, Adele was with her. Mom said she wanted to rid her of the memories that pop up with every step. Adele was like a zombie for another month before she came to me. I need a job. Your mom is great, but I need to go out somewhere and at least try to be productive again. After paying off the insurance and selling the house, I have about 400000 so it's time for me to go look for a house. I was overjoyed that she was going to stay here. I told her how happy I was, and she gave me a rare smile. I would have moved here when you suggested it. John was stubborn. I don't think I could have survived another winter there, especially being alone. On my recommendation, she was hired by my company. We didn't work together, but we had lunch together three or four times a week. It turned out that she was very good at the job she got, increasing the efficiency of our department by 4%. And although it didn't seem like much, the owners were very pleased. She made friends and found a small apartment. That's all I need at the moment. I think I would like to live on the lake, so when I get settled, we might be able to see a few places. I would like to know your opinion. I saw her once at one of the clubs at a bachelorette party. She laughed and was on the dance floor almost constantly, but I noticed that she didn't slow dance with anyone and didn't take drinks. She and John have been inseparable since she was 15, so I guess club life and her dating skills are a little forgotten. We talked about it the following Monday at lunch. I saw you on Saturday. You can still move, girl. Adele blushed but then grinned. Why weren't you there? I would love to dance with you. I was in the billiard room, participated in a darts tournament. I was doing pretty well until this Brit showed up. I don't know if they invented this game, but they definitely know how to throw. Besides, I didn't want the old memories to overshadow the new ones. Her face turned grim. I had a good time, but when I returned home, I felt guilty. It's not worth it. It's been almost a year since we lost him, and you've had a lot of good years. I would kill for a woman to love me as much as you love him. But he's gone, and you're still here, still young and deserve to be happy. He probably laughed himself to death watching. Why didn't you find someone else? You're not repulsive. You have a good job and a house on the lake. I figured some local woman could pick you up in no time. I came close to it a couple of times, but it didn't work out. I believe she's here somewhere, but she's hiding very well right now. I wouldn't worry too much. As soon as you stop looking, you'll find her. Maybe she's been right under your nose all this time. If that's the case, then the military needs to hire her as a disguise expert immediately. We talked about other things and then went back to work.